the school committee meeting to order at 7.37 and ask you to please rise for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is the <coughs> approval of the agenda. Pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. DeMonica. Second? Second. By Mr. Dunnan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? That motion carries 6-0. And noting for the record that Mr. Salvatore is absent this evening. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, approval of minutes for regular meeting 828-2014, executive session 828-2014, enrollment report from 9-1, school police report of 8-1, and residency truancy report from 9-1. Pleasure of the committee on the consent agenda. Motion by Mr. Mutter, second by Mr. Fiorello. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Next item is the report out of the executive session meeting from 9 11 2014. There were um, no votes taken at that meeting, and I need a vote to seal the minutes of the executive session. Motion by Mrs. Teal. Second. Second by Mr. Fiorello. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Next item on the agenda, Dr. Thornton, Superintendent, Report Retirement Recognitions. This will be a board retirement this evening, Ms. Ricasino. Is she here this evening? Yeah. Here she is. Come on. This evening, we have one retirement, Ms. Ricasino, a Cumberland resident, started teaching back on February 14th, about 1986. So, 20 years uh, in Cumberland, mostly at the Elves. Uh, multiple our appreciation we have a couple of COVID that we have to our retirees. Of getting a policy in 
place that would make that a two uh, meeting endeavor um, in the uh, future. So we'll be putting that together, or I'll be putting that together so, and submitting that uh, to either go through fiscal or policy or both. Um, we talked about uh, designated fund balance and whether or not uh, that can be done after the close of the fiscal year, and we're informed that that uh, can be done. And on the discussion, our vote to approve RFP Rhode State funding formula impact improvement backslash BEP compliance. We did have some discussion. Um, I'm assuming that we'll we take any action to that committee, but we will discuss that very well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Apologies for skipping over the very important agenda thing. I do have a question about fund balance. Can we transfer dollars to fund balance at any time? I know there's a point in time in which we have to make um, funds available, and there's a there's a there's a deadline in which we kind of open it up. Can you talk a little bit about that, Mr. Well, you would, well, you would transfer you would transfer funds to some of those designated areas. At the end of a fiscal year, when you knew what those, you know, what your operations, you know, results to operations were. I mean, designate money like in August is one of those things, not knowing how, how the rest of the budget will play out. Okay. Thank you. Right. Next item is Achievement and Communication Subcommittee update. Uh, we did not meet on Tuesday. We will meet um, in a few weeks uh, alongside policy and likely for fiscal on Tuesday, two weeks from Tuesday. Next item on the agenda is comments from the public. Does anyone wish to speak this evening? And I just want to acknowledge our council members, Kearns, Mr. Murray, and um, Mr. Schmidt, Councilor Schmidt. Thank you for joining us. I think I said Mr. Kearns, yes. I, I can say it again. He likes Welcome, to Mr. Kearns. <laughs> Next item, new business. Discussion and or vote to approve an RFP, Rhode Island State Funding Formula Impact and Improvement, BEP compliance. We had discussed, as many of you are aware, the concerns that we've had about our BEP compliance. And in addition, we felt that there are certain aspects of the funding formula that are becoming or continuing to be problematic for us. Um, we believe that we need to bring a solution to the table and that we need to have an understanding of where we do, uh, where we are compliant and where we may not be in the compliance area. Um, if you look at uh, globally, it tends uh, it, it, money. More monies are needed for high school programs than elementary school programs. What you find with our per student dollars is that's actually the opposite. So, as a lot of us have talked a little bit about, um, you know, what what the high school does or doesn't offer. Some of the general feeling in the community is that it doesn't offer the the services for. Um, all students, so kids who may be going into certain trade areas. We know it's struggling in its um, technology offerings for engineering and mathematics, and we're beginning to explore that. But, um, I, you know, I think it raises another concern around the topic of, well, what is our school program required to have, and what are we funding? And we also know, in addition to that, that there is um, the the obligation for the charter school, and that that their enrollment is at it's a, about its halfway point. So the the tuition requirement for them, if they double tomorrow, would double for us. Um, additionally, there's also the requirement for the the local share to meet what our local share is. So there's a continued obligation in that regard. Um, and then lastly, there's been discussion around what the local obligation really is. And it varies from community to community based on the, the, the need. And we want to be certain that um, our students do receive the appropriate funding. We're in kind of a complicated issue with our two school districts. And um, I think it's time for us to take a closer look at that. And I know, Mr. Munner, that you had talked about that in fiscal. And I didn't know if there was any other um, points that you wanted to add around that. Thank you, Madam 
Madam Chair. Yeah, um, I think what, again, my um, consideration here and on, and on the docket actually for a discussion about potentially developing an Roscoe administration to develop an RFP was the, this uh, fact that the town had, had uh, contributed it, the maximum, uh, the last, pretty much the maximum, the last two uh, to three years, and that the state uh, funding had gone up, but yet our, our per pupil expense had gone down, and, and, and how that uh, could happen. And so, it, you know, as I said, the fiscal it's my belief that uh, the money follows a child, and that was an easily understandable concept, and I think. Uh, you know, everyone would agree that you shouldn't receive funding when you're not providing service. And, uh, so the funding formula is kind of, uh, you know, and obviously it's a complicated uh, formula with a lot of uh, pieces to it, but, you know, on, on, on the basic level, that makes sense. And that you should um, certainly have different opportunities. You have them in every other aspect of life and uh, why you wouldn't have them in education. Uh, I think it's a difficult argument to make. Um, I, I obviously support the uh, fact that you should have a choice uh, and uh, that they should be good choices, but the fact that the money follows a child is not a one-to-one -one correlation in that the savings uh, don't follow um, you know, the, uh, the revenue that goes uh, with, the, with the child to whichever school is a, is a fit. That family decides to fit for, for that child. So, uh, and then the, especially here in uh, Cumberland, where uh, most of the dialogue is spent on where the, the entity that where the money goes, where I don't feel that's beneficial to uh, anyone in the uh, in the long or the long haul. I believe that it's in the in the formula and that that. You know, I'm tiptoeing, as I said, at fiscal. I'm not saying anybody didn't think about it. I think they probably did, but I think that the, the choice here is at a different uh, level than it is uh, in, in other communities, and that uh, when it gets to be a fairly sizable number, and that gap is uh, much more difficult to uh, bridge, if you will. So, uh, you know, my thought is that to ask us to go uh, develop an RFP in which that could be measured. Uh, that, that the difference between the, the money following the child and the savings not in respect or with respect to the BEP, which of course is, a, you know, might be, a, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if it can actually be done, but I'm, I'm forever hopeful on things like that. So, but, um, you know, if you believe, uh, that we're uh, not providing the BEP uh, as it is uh, legislated that we do so and that we are to propose a budget that um, does, then you know, we ought to try to find out and it's, uh, that we're doing our job. And, but it, I do believe that if we're not, I think that that gap is responsible for most of it. And, and to not address that and, and to go to the town every year when they if, 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 you're give, if they're providing you the max that they can and it's still not denting the per pupil expense, we're just going to keep rolling down this road every single year. And all it does is, in my mind, uh, at the very least, it, it doesn't create confidence uh, amongst the community. It doesn't create any sort of community feeling towards education. It pits people against people, which I don't think uh, is the goal. Uh, was the goal or should be the goal, and we need to take the heat out of some of that uh, conversation and and, uh, and make sure that the, that the playing field is uh, as level as it can possibly be. So my thought is that we would develop the RFP to see if we could measure this. I, I think all stakeholders could benefit because, as I said in fiscal, if you're a leader of, that believe that there should be more choices, it, it's been proven already that there are going to be some communities that feel that that's not in their best interest because uh, it, it may take uh, revenue or resources away and uh, so that's going to uh, eliminate uh, possibilities of choice. So it would, I think it benefits uh, all parties involved 
that that gap be addressed and uh, as, as well as it could be, comparatively speaking, to the BET. Uh, and in that way, you'd have a professionally done study or report or something that you could take to, to whether it be a delegation, I think it, obviously it would be at the beginning, to see if, you, if um, as this funding formula has now been rolled out, in, uh, and it, that there is still maybe some tweaking to be done. Uh, I don't think that that would be unexpected with a, a legislation of you know, that size. So as opposed to just hoping things get better or pointing fingers, my feeling would be to uh, try to get to uh, the point of where it might be lacking. And I think that that's a, I, I really do believe that there's a gap there uh, that, that can, that's understandable and that can be proven. And I think that all people who uh, believe that you should get the same fair shot uh, will see it. And uh, so I'd like to see us try to find it, as opposed to the, you know, the other. I'm always one of these fields that we keep knocking on the door. We didn't get the answer the lot, the, the first couple of times or whatever. So I just moved to the next door. I'm not, I don't, I'm not one to throw my hands up and say, well, you know, but that didn't work. And oh well, what was me? I, I think there's a gap. I think it, it uh, to reiterate that, it, I think it would benefit everyone who has an interest in better education, whether it be here or anywhere in the state, and uh, I'm advocating for us to uh, try to develop uh, an RFP that could get us closer to that objective. Thank you. Mrs. Taylor, with the intent of this RFP to, to also to um, understand more what was your obligation is if we fund the basic education program to also answer that question. I mean, I, I understand the intent is to try to answer the question of the impact of the charter schools on our budget and what's the shortfall in the core funding formula, but a component of that core funding formula is the local share. Is that also part of the intent of this RFP is to answer that question? Well, I, I can say that um, I, I can be anything can to anything that seven people or four people vote for can be part of anything that you want the administration to do. So it certainly could be. I think that you know we we kind of pushed that issue, or we did push that issue, and I don't think it's, I think it's valuable information, and I think it, it would, by, by, just by its natural progression, will come up. I, I think that, uh, you know, Ryan didn't want to take a stand on that, and, um, you know, that was disappointing, but I think, I think as you would go through the BEP and, and the fact that and the formula and how it was derived, I think that it would be naturally part of it anyway. But I, but I do think that uh, when you're sitting on, as a mayor or town council and you're at the max, uh, now granted, you didn't, there are historical things that happen that are, you know, that have an effect now, just like anything else. But once again, it's time to move on to me. It's, it's time to, to stop. You know uh, how we got here is you know always it's valuable. It's a good discussion, but you know how we get to somewhere to me is a little more valuable where I would be at this time. But uh, I think I think it would naturally happen. But the long, I mean, the short answer to that is whatever anyone went on that RFP, as long as they have three of uh, their colleagues to vote for, that's what they're telling me. I'll just end by saying I think at one point when we met Ride, and it wasn't the aspirational conversation or any subsequent conversation, but it was really in the beginning when we started to raise concerns, they said to us, prepare for both. And if you get your head around those three words, you understand that your responsibility isn't just to build your own stronger program, but it's to address the concerns that are being raised, and this is certainly a concern that's been raised in the community. You feel like you're either, um, you know, on one side or another. We can't talk about it. We can't. Um, we can't be happy for one another because you, many people in the community, and not all, feel that there's it's a struggle and it's a challenge, and it creates a lot of tension. Um, if we have a, a means to address some of it that we can bring locally forward or that we can bring forward to the General Assembly, it's a solution and it's really up to us 
to say we think this is a good solution. It's then up to the you know the, the dignitaries in town to decide this is a good solution, or it's also up to the general assembly possibly if they're willing to have a discussion with us about some of the the pitfalls or the uh, the strengths of the program. I think it was put in place for good reason, um, but like anything, when they passed it that many years ago, this this wasn't really an issue for us, and, and, and now certainly funding is a is a big issue. Um, so I would expect we'll have um, probably at the next meeting something drafted. So if there is specific input that members want to provide, um, I would work with Dr. Dr. Thornton and Alex and Jeff and myself just to try and get that together so we can get that ball rolling. Anything else? Sure. Mr. I mean, you know, the, the whole idea behind it was, um, was that it didn't matter where you went to school, whether it be in Pawtucket or Barrington, Wesley, wherever, uh, that you were entitled, I guess for the word, uh, lack of a better word, to the basic education plan, but it, it uh, a basic education program which is another part of not they're both the same as two. But, um, and it, it should matter where, where you go to school. It shouldn't matter even inside the community. I mean, I think they looked at it for different communities, but it shouldn't matter if you go to Garvin or you go to BVP or you go to whatever school you go to. I mean, uh, you know, there's this, if, if, if the funding formula, uh, you know, by its uh, passage, uh, puts money to uh, follow the child, that's not the fault of where the child goes. And, it, and too many times, uh, you, you know, here, that's where the energy has gone. It's been bolting where it goes. It's not, it's just not the proper place. Uh, and those are, are taxpayers in, in, in this town that make that choice, and they sh you should be able to make that choice, and you should be berated for making it. Uh, and you should be berated uh, for how the money goes, and because we didn't design that. Nobody here decided that, and actually nobody in the town, it wasn't a town vote or anything of that nature. It goes there because that's the legislation in which uh, we deal with. So if there's a way to make that, uh, and, and the question, and all I'm saying right now is I don't know, uh, but certainly we'd be looking for us to take a positive vote to uh, investigate it, because I, you know, it is, a, it is a resource issue, but it is a community issue as well. And, and uh, and, you know, if we're going to be who we want to be, ultimately as a community, we're going to need to put this thing to bed. And, and so hopefully uh, it, it, uh, it shows that, uh, and I think it will, that there is a, uh, a gap there, and, it, and it's a gap that means something. And anybody who wants to, uh, for all the kids to succeed, should do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, facilities update. Projects completed, planned, and outstanding. Dr. Yes, um, you have three documents in front of you that we can take through and I'll myself. The first document, if you look at it, it says Capital Improvement 2015. The second one, entitled FCAP Summary, kind of a larger document. The last one we look at is Capital Projects Remaining Authority. So to start with, we can take you through the Capital Included in 2015. Essentially, we want to tell you about what's been already completed or underway this year for capital. Certainly the list of any capital uh, you know, item project is not all inclusive. We can always do more. And as we go through this, certainly uh, for yourself, take notes on maybe things you think we should move up on the list and uh, kind of shift around. So if you've got a pulse check so far of where we are, um, I'll do Ashton. Um, please jump in now. So, um, we have had a lighting problem at Ashton, and now it's completed. The parking lot was rather dark, so now if we're at Ashton School, it, it's a well-lit parking lot that was taken care of before. The floodlights taken care of there, uh, some rug replacement, some uh, roof flashing was done, we had a leak in the car that was addressed at, at Ashton, and also some landscaping and sweeping completed. Um, we still have outstanding refurbishment of the energy management system. At community, a lot of issues around ceiling tiles, a lot of dated tiles, so that's uh, on our list for just a real comprehensive big, big bite of that. Um, a slab for our dumpster is uh, on our list right now this year. To, playground fence. We did remove some bushes. Many schools will see bushes that were um, probably rather old. And over time, they get very big and almost unmanageable. So phase one was to pull out some of the large ones and plant some this fall that are more manageable. That's happening in, in, in many of the schools. So the community is one of them. Uh, landscaping and sweeping. Blinds at community. A lot of ones with uh, something simple as blinds. But in that building, it, it, it's a problem. So that's how this uh, this, this fall. Once again, the interim management system, and once again, I see planting of some, of some trees. 
Compound Hill, if you pull on Compound Hill, you'll see some issues with curbing. We did some work on that last year, but some of it remains. That's a pretty costly venture to do curbing, so we find it a little bit cheer, and that's on our list. Security cameras, looking for more cameras still around the playground area, I believe, to kind of isolate those areas. Uh, a screen in the auditorium. The screen's not functioning right now, and, and the auditorium, like we talked about, this was set one night, I, I know. Um, the utility being repaired is on our list. Landscaping again, some vinyl siding. Uh, at Garvin, we did do, uh, or we're in the process of, I'm sorry, doing the carpet at Garvin School. We did finish the carpet at North Cumberland Middle, but Garvin's carpet also uh, needs to be replaced. It kind of has a, a wavy effect, if you will, in the, in the library. So that's being done. Uh, drainage from playgrounds completed. And once again, the energy management system conversation. We turn to page two, BF Norton. Chimney repair, we talked about that in physical sub, the chimney BF, and I need some major attention. A, a new library carpet, extending the concrete sidewalk, cafeteria tables completed, uh, landscaping also completed, the courts, more cameras. The courts done a, a lot of work in terms of a face that have been in there, the entire inside's painted, but now the last Case that is actually painting the lockers, so we don't know that's on the list right now. AC in the civil room is completed, that, that's great news. Also, AC in the lab, that's completed. Uh, the roof facade is still um, has some problems. The canopy, the old style canopy at McCord, look closely. We did replace the boardwork on the outside as you go around, but the interior boards are still probably original, have to be all taken down, so that's very problematic. So that's on our list for, uh, for this year. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, North Cumberland, the income system is an interesting story. Uh, my channel is kind of like our MacGyver, and uh, with that one, the intercom is uh, probably circa 1980s. We've had different issues with it cutting out and whatnot, but uh, this past week we might get another go at it, and we think right now we can probably still keep the intercom. A lot of the wiring gets loose, and as Mike explained it to me at my level, if one wire is um, not working, if you will, they can kind of short the system. So they're going through all the wires, they going through the phone, and uh, it's still it's on the list. It's a, it's a worry. It's a Christmas tree. Christmas tree. It's a worry it's not being replaced at this point. It's on our list. Our red carpet, as I mentioned, was completed. Um, a boiler. New curtain for the stage. If you want to knock on the middle and look at the felt curtain, you would be uh, concerned. So uh, we are taking care of that. So that's, that's happening. High school, we saw last uh, month the grip work. That's completed in front of the um, building in the pool area. So that, that was completed. Um, whiteboards are, are being completed. The Wellness Elevator is on it because it's a, it's a concern. It uh, breaks down a lot. And it's not one reason why it does, but it's just not always. It's, it's a recurring problem, so we have to keep that on our list. AC in the office is completed. High school sign completed. Landscaping, uh, that's, that's ongoing, but right now we're you know, ahead of that. And once again, the boiler. Now the last page are things on my mind or Alex's mind that we don't have in the list yet, but concern us. We'd love to put them on the list, but some of them have, have big prices associated with them. It's not all inclusive. Here's where I, I prefer to you to tell me what else you want on this list in terms of moving forward. Um, Ashton, we have a beach gym floor, a bubbling, ceiling tiles, and, and grids. My community school, window repairs. A lot of dated windows with large gaps, especially the old window community, and it's um, kind of problematic in terms of replacement because um, when you do replacement of those uh, windows, they're old, and if you don't do it right, you actually run into PCBs. You can't just go in there and take the windows out. It's a whole process. So we're mindful on how we do it and when we do it. So that's, that's on our list. Uh, you look down further, the driveway exit. I think Mr. Mother and I walked a couple years ago around the community looking for maybe a second exit out of communities parking lot because it's problematic with the traffic flow. So if you get a second exit, that's about ten thousand dollar ticket that was your your uh, sense of what it costs for that kind of thing. Uh, Cumberland Hill, once again gym floor issues, curb repairs, Garvin, we have windows, BF power washing. We're really impressed. Yes. Can I ask you about the gym floor bubbling? Mm -hmm. Is that in the new PE space? Is is that new? Yes, yeah, so the two new gyms that Do we know what the cause of that is? No, it could be, it's going to leak, it could be, you know, we're not sure, but we're looking into it, we just, we, we noticed that when we went out on our, on our, 
section of the cell. So we set it on the list, which that would get to the bottom of it. And that building space about five years it's been there? Um, so. Five, after that, I think that was eight, so zero two after that, that's 86. That's much longer than that. Um, power wash, we mentioned power wash the high school and that, we're really happy with how it looks. Um, so we're going to list now also a BF being the same kind of style to, to power wash BF would be just a great, great uh, improvement. Parking at BF is certainly a concern and that's, that's on our list. Um, court, uh, gym lighting, bleachers, canopy I mentioned, unit vents, the heaters at both the court and the high school are very dated. Remember last year we had the uh, freeze issue. And when they pop, it's a series of units that all pop like a chain. And I asked how easily well to get a new one. You can't buy these. You have to uh, just kind of solder or what's the word term? Yeah, they solder the coil inside, but the coils are so rotted. Instead of having you know six rows, some of them only have two or three rows. So. Right. I also learned that McCourt, especially, was told to me in a simple way where it's almost like a one relay system for the entire McCourt area, maybe two relays. Uh, the high school might have, say, 40 or 50 zones. If one zone goes in the court, it could take out half the building. One freezing event. So it's on our list, certainly. It's a concern, the unit event conversation. The board of exhaust at the court, uh, north gym lighting, once again, unit events, lighting. Well, the center, the AC, we're still having issues with the wellness in terms of temperature regulation. Also, the windows, if any kind of strong rain comes, we get flooding in the wellness center all the time for the window areas. That's been reoccurring. Um, so that's some brickwork, uh, some screen. Um, there's a practice field. I was talking to our new AD uh, about this, and we have been thinking about it. You may know the practice field behind the high school for a lot of the sports teams. It's really not something that we, uh, we have to look at it now. It's really problematic. It's um, kind of hard to the surface, if you will. We have to really look at probably a protocol for the fall and next spring in terms of tilling it, uh, loom, seed. The challenge is irrigation. And run a hose out that far, the water should so long you can't get water on it. So that's why I work with the town to probably split a hydrant, if you will, tap into it to irrigate it. So that's on our list. Also, I'm talking about turf at community school. If you look out the back where the kids would play in that large field, same conversation. That field really is what I would call playable. It's a rough surface. We're talking about loom seeding and really you know, taking care of that. Those are things that we, you know, typically don't get to because they're not. They're not Really, super cheap items to get to. The list. Um, and also, um, I can't not mention this Mike Chandler, the backup generator. In front of the tour still, we have it still. It's our V8 engine in the back, the backup generator for uh, this building, uh, especially the computer nerve center over here. Um, it's actually okay to keep that, I've been told, for lighting. It has the right configuration for lighting backup. But as Mike explains to me, I forgot Mike how many. It has the wrong frequency or the wrong connectivity to back up computers. Those are my words. So we use it. Last time we had a power outage, the generator kept pickuping. And I think Mike came in by chance once and when we were down. And if that thing heats up, that's our, that's our server room. So we have to look at a separate, dedicated, probably smaller generator. We can keep that one for the lighting. It's old, but it works. Testing regularly. We need a, a new generator for the new computer out there. So that's the first list. Any questions on, on that? I'll just add that a lot of these items go sky pretty much are in our budget. A lot of other items we just we're just doing as we find these things. And at the top you see that we have our own capital budget which has four hundred some thousand dollars in this year, but we also have the Sedexo budget, the maintenance budget there. So between those two budgets that we manage in that Sedexo budget, that, that's so it's just we look at it and say we don't have the money for this. It's also the allocation that comes back to us. This is Tia. At community school, the cement slab for the dumpster, has that um, drainage ever been dealt with over there? The kids haven't been there in a while, but that dumpster area and that back door it used to be a flood zone. Is that resolved now? Or is that and part of this project? It's not part of this project. It was just to get the dumpsters because they're not supposed to, they're supposed to not sit in grass and stuff. And slab over there, so they would be, you know, sit the way they should. I'm not aware of it. Maybe it's been resolved, but that back by the gym used to flood. Yeah, and the dumpster is not there anymore. Yeah, 
Oh, she was doing it. Okay. You don't want a dumpster by a back door of a school with all the, you know, slab and put it off a ways. Uh, okay. In the heat of the day, it would be not a pleasant experience in the dumpster by the back door. So, no. right. Second document, just the FCAP, kind of the same conversation, okay. broken out in pieces. Alex, anything you want to talk about? Yeah, well, the FCAP, probably the next thing you should go to is the capital projects sheet, the one page of. And that's what kind of lead into the stage one, stage two um, applications that we need to apply. Um, the capital projects, the main authority, was, originally there was a three and a half million dollar authority that Congress had back many, many years ago. As of June of 2013, and this tied in with the school department and ties in with Y, we both have the same exact number. It's a million six fifty nine of that was already now. Projects that were completed in fiscal 13 and 14, you can see total of 351,000, leaving a million 308 left in this authority. So remember, it's an authority, it's not money on the stage, it's an authority we have. And, and on that authority, the reimbursement of 20%, the reimbursement that uh, comes in on school construction. If you look at our proposed projects for 14 and 15, with the two big ones being the two high school, the two levels of the high schools, you know, we see one or something thousand dollars there, and you see the remaining, you see up above there was two hundred something thousand for security doors, there's another three hundred and fifty thousand as we're finishing that project. So between the two fiscal years, there'd be a million two thirty five that we'll use this year. Not even count some of the things that are on here that you know we're left that we kind of do as the year was on. It's gonna leave us with an authority on the seventy two thousand dollars. So Starting next year, anything we do in the area of capital will not be reimbursed unless we get this stage one, stage two app, um, application to the state approved. And I guess that's the next thing on the agenda. What I did is, um, I, you know, this is the, those, that final book is the application, the stage one application. And if there were 14 different tabs and different questions that they asked, and I think we went through one night, Russ, telling you some of the type of things they asked. Uh, you know, that we provide them. Some of the, some of the things we're able to answer now, and in that, but in the stage two process, things that we don't answer in stage one, we can answer at that point. For example, they ask for plans and costs and feasibility studies. Well, we don't even know what projects we're gonna do yet because we don't know what kind of funding we'll have and stuff. So we're certainly not gonna go out and have higher architects and engineers and, but, you know, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a project and maybe not get the project even off the ground, but, Year, you know, two, three, four years, you know, things would change and the rest of it. So you have that opportunity in the stage two piece. So the, the, the good news is we finished the stage one application, we met with the building committee, that's a part of it, um, uh, that's a requirement to have when you go forward with these applications. And we um, voted to send this now off to the state, you know, to ride for their, uh, for their to accept it. And what they'll do is they'll come and meet with the building start going on the project and, 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 and the rest of it. Um, there's still a moratorium on it. So that's what, you know, so we want to at least get size right so that if the moratorium is lifted, we can go forward with some of those projects. The FCAP study is part of that, and that's a summary that Phil talked about. What I just basically did to make it easier, because the FCAP goes page after page after page, you know, um, in, in the book. I just tried to take it and summarize it, and I did it by HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and sudden human interior and exterior material items, and so it goes down by school. And um, if you go to the back, you get an idea of some of the big items. The, the, the total is 12 million nine. The upcap study shows 13 change, but some of the things we completed, so I took them off. But you see some of the big things, for example, the court roof is a big one. We have asbestos fall through some of the schools. Some of the schools have no issues. Some of them do have asbestos tiles. We don't have any issues, but in the FCAP, at some point, you would think you would want to replace these tile, these asbestos tile floors and stuff like that. And we've got them, we've got the cost of that scattered throughout, throughout the, uh, the, the five years, mostly in the later years of this project. Some of them you may never do, you know, because it's still fine, the school is still in good shape, you don't have to. But it's something that when they when Sodexo does a study like this, they kind of take like what, what should be the life or something. And they kind of like, you know, if this is floors are down here 30 years, you know, at some point they're gonna have to make, address it. So he thinks like asbestos, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, 
Willie Bellows. So some of the big categories, these things kind of pop up at a menu in school. So I just kind of stuck with them and put that in the program. So that's basically the FCAP summarized. But so, you know, hopefully we get this, uh, we can get this FCAP um, you know, up to the state. That it, it's a free or by the similar um, idea that I've tried to hand them out tonight to the uh, to various um, committee members that have had it. Um, the one thing we still need to get done, and you know, uh, um, we need to get a letter of intent signed by the town, the school committee chair, and the superintendent. And so I work with Brian Silva to try, Sylvia to try to get that letter signed by the mayor at this point. Maybe Mayor Elect Murray should be on there because many of this stuff will be under his term. I'm not sure how if he has to or not, but, but you know, certainly the mayor, current mayor, has to. And. Um, and then the other thing, um, you know, that, you know, we need to, you know, the moratorium, we need the moratorium to be lifted so we can, we might have read in the paper a couple of weeks ago, it was in the Sunday paper, it was $1.8 billion in school construction projects that are just sitting in the state. This is going to be the next crisis for schools in, in Rhode Island because, you know, hard to sit here and recommend, gee, let's spend half a million dollars on the roof, and then in eight months they lift the moratorium and like everyone's saying, like, you're not going to get reimbursed, but what did you do is, why don't you get them so it's that? Do you do it or uh, not do it? You know? So things of an emergency nature, you know, reimburse immediately, and things that, you know, maybe not qualify as emergency, but you know, need to be done because you know they're not high cost, but just to, you know, they need to be done in the district. You can't wait, we'll have to do it. Certainly things like uh, replacing roofs and major projects. That was one of the reasons why, you know, the um, when we did the the um, pool building. We pulled out the repointing at this time. It was 71,000 repointing. We sealed it, we cleaned it, we did the cracks of the brickwork that were really you know, expanded and stuff. But we pointed the whole building we left off because it was over $70,000. And it's going to, you know, eventually you're going to have no allocation to anything. So that'll be the next, uh, that'll be the next crisis in schools. <coughs> Take a look at the LCAP. We hope to get it up to the, you know, to the state shortly. And um, I mean, not the LCAP, the state one application. Yeah, a year from the stage one application to submit to stage two. I think we would try to fast track it and not take a whole year. Um, and you know, we, we've had some discussions with the building committee. We've asked the finance director now to take a look at the, what the debt service is in the town and how debt service may be dropping up as bonds get paid off. To get, to get an idea of just what side bond issue we may hope to maybe um, be able to, you know, have put on put on a referendum for school, for school improvements. And once we get that kind of figure, we can then size these projects and have an idea of what are our priorities. And you know, like $13 million, dollars, do everything. But I would recommend that because some of those things you won't have to do. We won't have to replace, you know, plumbing every school in the next couple of years, that type of stuff. But we certainly need a good chunk to start doing some of the things that um, will, will you know, need to be done and will lead to more costs the longer they sit. In, in just the first condition. So I don't know if there's any questions. I think people haven't seen this before uh, on the state application, but if you take a look at it and if you have any questions, you know, we can always have a little discussion with this in a, you know, in a little meeting down the road in a few weeks. So, uh, Question? Is the, the stage one application time sensitive? Is there a deadline or is no. there some priority around no, it? No, it's, it's nice to submit it. I would like to try to get it at some stage two period if we just could get it in for that. Um, we didn't have a building committee put together and stuff at that point. Because a lot of communities expected the moratorium to be lifted then and there were a lot of communities going in. And basically what happens, they can't say no Cumberland, yes Lincoln, no Providence, yes Pawtucket. So when a lot of communities usually go in, it's usually they all get passed, you know, that type of thing. It's, I guess it's good to go in with color, you know, that type of thing. But, um, you know, I, the, the big thing is that you have just a year from when you do get it in to do the stage two and to do all the, you know, feasibility studies and other things out of the end um, I won't go through the questions. I did it one other time with you guys, and I'm sure people, you know, really say it the only thing. Then you read on section five, you have to put your up there. Yeah, but read on and we can, you know, I'm happy to go over it. We can discuss it in a, the school committee when you have questions, maybe I don't know. Perfect. Thank you. All set? Thank you. Alright, moving on. So we've
talked about projects completed, planned, and outstanding, and we've moved to stage one application, but we don't need to vote on that as a committee. That's just going to move forward as an application. Perfect. Next item, discussion and or vote to approve homeschool instruction requests for the 14-15 school year. Recommend approval of that as indicated. Pleasure of the committee. Motion by Mr. Mutter. Second by Mrs. Teal. Any further discussions? All those in favor? Who's opposed? That carries 6-0. Thank you. Next item, personnel recommendations. Mrs. Vogel. Thank you. So I just have appointments for you this evening. Uh, so I request the, the advice and consent of the school committee on the following appointments. Denise Burko, student management clerk at the Cumberland High School, effective August 28, 2014. She's a full-time employee. She's an ICSI employee, so her co-pay is 10%. Rodney Cody, custodian, Knights at North Cumberland Middle School, effective August 25th, 2014. Again, he's an ICSI employee. His co-pay will be 13%. Gina Duguano, supervisor of nursing at, Cum at the Cumberland School Department, effective 9-15-2014. Uh, Ms. Duguano is already an employee with us. She's already a school nurse teacher, so we're just adding on this stipend. She's been hired as the new supervisor. Uh, Roberta Duran, custodian Knights at Cumberland High School, effective August 25th, 2014. Again, he's an ICSI member. His uh, copay is 13%. Janelle Garneau, science teacher at North Cumberland Middle School, effective 9-3-2014. She is a 0 .6 Step one with a 22% copay. Sarah M. Godino, not to be confused, we have another Sarah C. Godino, which will be interesting going forward. Uh, Spanish teacher at North Cumberland Middle School, effective 9 8 2014. Um, just for the committee's um, knowledge, um, Sarah Brady, who was the Spanish teacher at North Cumberland Middle School, was originally a French teacher. Um, so when Madame Shaw retired, um, Ms. Brady wanted to go back to teach French, so she took French, so we hired a Spanish teacher, which is actually much easier for us than finding a French teacher, so, um, so we hired Ms. Godino, we're very happy about that. Um, she is full-time, she's a step seven, she has a master's, and she's at 22%. James Marslin, custodian nights at North Carmel Middle School, effective August 25th of 2014, a Canon ICSI member, he's one of the new custodians, and he pays 13% copay. Caitlin Oler, she was already on your uh, request, but I had initially appointed her as a 0.5. Um, but after a conversation with uh, um, uh, Mr. Damana and with approval from Dr. Thornton, she's been uh, increased to a full-time employee based upon needs with the new CHIPS program. So I brought her forward for you so you would know that now she's a full-time employee at step one. Uh, and lastly, Sarah Polari, math teacher at North Cumberland Middle School, Effective 9-8-2014. She's a 0 0.6 at a step one, and she's 22%. And I guess besides that, I don't know if you want to probably want to take those, and then I'll do the coaching. Sorry. Let's do that, and then the coaching. Sorry about that. No worries. Pleasure of the committee. Motion to approve the personal recommendation. Motion by Mr. Fiorello. Second by Mr. Gannon to approve the appointments. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Then I guess second, yeah, secondly, I'd like to uh, request the appointments uh, outlined in uh, Chris Tagian's, the athletic director's memo dated August 18th, 2014, uh, for the fall coaches. Um, the majority of the coaches are rehires, um, with the exception, I believe, of the North Cumberland Middle School boys soccer coaches, who are both new hires and are certified. So they read through worse. all of them, or you said they were certified. They are certified. Yes, I'm sorry, but they they are new to us. Thank you. Should we read these into the record, or are we going to? I don't. I don't think it's required. I'm afraid about pronouncing some of their names. <laughs> <laughs> and let me ask you: Does this satisfy all of the? This is for fall. Yes. Correct. So we have no outstanding fall coaches. All coaching positions for fall have been filled. And this we is for the high school and the middle school? High school and middle school, that's correct. Okay. Pleasure of the committee. Mr. DeMotta, can we move passage? Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Denon. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And that motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Mrs. Bogle. Next item school committee comments, school liaison reports. Do we have a report? Any comments? Thank you. Mr. Delano. I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Guyavan School Room and the Court PTO meetings. They're off and running and uh, things look good in the Court. It's now a 501c, so the you know, charitable contributions are working well enough because of it. I think uh, we should have a good year. Thank you. I heard Garvin School is doing a little mini mutter. Yes. So they're going to have like a little obstacle. Fun activity that sounds pretty, pretty slick. Anyone else? And it's my understanding we do not have executive session this evening, so I need a motion to adjourn. Mr. DeMonica, do I have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Teal. All those in favor? Move.